Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Susan Kelly, President-Elect of the City Club. Welcome to another outstanding City Club program. Today we focus on early childhood learning with guest speaker Dr. Patricia Kuhl, co-director of the Center for Mind, Brain, Brain and Learning at the University of Washington. Join us for a special program on higher education on Friday, March 15th, entitled Higher Education Changing the Face of the Future. This program will feature Jesus Caron, president of Portland Community College. This program will be held at the Hilton Hotel Ballroom, so please note the change in location. For those of you who may not be aware, the City Club website offers access to our research pro reports, past club program presentations, upcoming events, and a membership and information. Check us at our site, www.portlandcityclub.org. We have received, we have reached the end of the first week of March, and we're not quite halfway to our goal of 100 new members during this current membership drive. So please be um, very uh, uh, inviting to friends that may join, and those of you as guests today, please think about joining. Our board host today is Carol Witherall, member of the Board of Governors and professor of education at Lewis and Clark College, and she will ask the first question of our speaker. Following Carol's question, we will open the program to questions from City Club members here in the audience. Please line up behind the microphone and um, on the floor and before Carol is finished so that we have time to ask as many questions as possible. Please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. Broadcast to City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from the following, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, Pacific Care, and Warehouser Company Foundation. We are very grateful for their support. Dr. Patricia Kuhl is a professor at the University of Washington and co-director of the UW Center for Mind, Brain, Brain and Learning. Her research has focused on the study of language and the processing of language by the brain. The work has played a major role in demonstrating how early exposure to language alters the mechanisms of perception, changing a person's abilities to hear certain distinctions in speech. Her work also shows that the processing of language information occurs through many senses, including vision, both in early infancy and adulthood. The work has broad implications in extending to psychology and biology for its identification of critical periods in development to linguistics and education for its applicability to bilingual education, to neuroscience for its implications for brain mapping of complex information, and this is a part that's so fascinating, well, it all is, and to engineering for its implications concerning how computers may be programmed to respond to the spoken language. Dr. Kuhl is a recep recipient of many national awards and was invited to the White House by both Presidents Clinton and Bush to make presentations on early cognitive development. She has appeared in the PBS special, The Secret Life of the Brain, and the Nova series entitled The Mind, as well as many network interviews. She recently co-authored The Scientists in the Crib, Minds, Brains, and How Children Learn. So welcome today to Dr. Patricia Kuhl. Thank you, Susan, for that lovely introduction, and thank you all for the invitation to come to Portland. Uh, there's a blizzard going on in Seattle today, and so I'm much happier here than there. Something's changed about the way we think of and look at children. Have you noticed? Uh, if you look at your news magazines and newspapers and television specials, uh, we see that the academic professors are showing us brains lit up not only of adults who are listening to music or thinking about their mothers or something else, uh, but children whose brains are being studied to see how the synapses grow and bloom and telling us how important that early period in development is. So the academic institutions have pointed their attention toward the mind and brain of the child. It's not only the academics, though. Uh, look at business people. Business people are ever more interested in the toys and products and software and educational products that promise to improve your child's mind and perhaps get them into Harvard or at least to sleep better at night. But is it the case that we know much about these products? We have business, the attention of businessmen, and I think that's very good. Uh, do we know anything about most of the products on the shelves at Toys R Us and their educational value? Not too much. 
The third component, so we've got the academicians on board, business people are ever more interested in children and how they learn. Uh, what about society? Uh, the pictures of, of magazines, Time Magazine, Newsweek, um, U.S. News and World Report, show babies and how they learn. What do they know and when do they know it? Uh, and what make us wonder collectively about the education that our children uh, are receiving. And as uh, Susan said, two White House conferences have taken place, one in 1997, sponsored by uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton when they were in the White House, focused on early learning and the brain uh, to address Congress. I addressed Congress on some of the new data that I'll tell you about today about the minds and brains of, of children. And then again in uh, 2001, uh, Laura Bush and George Bush sponsored a conference on early cognitive development. As you, most of you know, Laura Bush is very interested in education, particularly with regard to reading and is very interested in trying to get every child who enters first grade uh, ready to read. It's surprising uh, to all of us, I guess, that in an industrial nation such as ours, that the level, the number, and percentages of children who are entering first grade unable and unprepared to read is not decreasing, but increasing. So academics, uh, business people, society at large, two White Houses on both sides of the aisle, and of course in our states, in the state of Washington, uh, where I live, in the state of, of Oregon, where you live, we have two very active governors who care a great deal about this topic. So in the state of Washington, Governor Gary Locke and his wife Mona Locke have established a, a commission on early learning. And here in Oregon, Governor Kitzhaber has a commission on early childhood and families. I spoke to a group of 300 there this morning, very active and eager uh, group of people. We're lucky, I believe, to be in the Pacific Northwest where this uh, topic is, is resonating so strongly. So we have an unusual situation where the university professors, who are usually off in the clouds, are focused on a topic that business people and society at large are very interested in. We have two White Houses who have sponsored conferences to tell us about children, and we have uh, governors in many states of the uh, United States who are focused again on trying to deliver uh, this, the research to practice transition, to try to have the research laboratory findings affect how we deal with children and what we do with our educational systems. So what's going on? Is this hype? Is it just another uh, topic that's uh, <coughs> politically being uh, pushed around because it generates a lot of interest in potential voters? Or is something really afoot? And I guess I'm here to tell you today that there really is something afoot. Uh, we are learning in the laboratories, in the, in the uh, nation's laboratories, not only here in the United States but across the world, that the abilities of children, and particularly very young babies, have been very underestimated. And I want to give you some examples about the kinds of things we've learned. Uh, we are approaching it from the standpoint of the science of learning. How is it that children acquire information? Is it really didactically? Is that how they start out, that we you know, feed them information and reward them for learning it? Or are they taking on information in another way? And I guess you might have guessed already that my message is they're taking on information, at least in the early years, in a totally different way than we might have expected. And I want to explain that to you, because I think it has implications very broadly for how we think about children and their processes of learning. Uh, the bottom line of the studies is that babies really are little sponges for what they see, what they hear, what they learn about objects in the world. Their learning is automatic. It's, in a sense, um, very sophisticated. In language, it's actually statistical. Babies listen to language, and it looks as though they're measuring some of the statistics involved in the language that they hear. And these statistical properties of the language they hear are coded by the brain and stored in a very indelible way that will affect their perception of language sounds their entire lives. So how do we know this? And is it typical just of language, or does it have to do with social-emotional development and cognitive development? And again, what I'll tell you is the uh, examples from language are just the tip of the iceberg. They tell us a lot about how the baby brain gets forged, how experience sculpts that brain's perception of the world and why that's important. 
So I'll start with some examples from my own laboratory. I look at the development of language, and I'm very interested in young kids. Uh, many of us think that language starts at the age of one year, when children are seen to label their first word, mama, dada. But at least that's what we all hope as parents. Um, but what the laboratory is showing us is that language development begins early in life. It even begins in the womb. Now, I'll start with studies early in life. We've set up laboratories in many countries of the world, in Japan, in Russia, in Sweden, in Finland, in France, and in the United States. In all those countries, I'm watching babies develop, looking at them very early in life to say, what do they know about language at birth? What do they come with? What's the native innate structure that they allows them to acquire this glorious ability uh, shared only by humans to communicate through language? And then we watch them as they grow to see how being bathed in French as opposed to Russian, as opposed to Swedish or Finnish or English, shapes the brain. And what happens when you're listening to two languages as opposed to one? Now, this isn't just an esoteric issue. Uh, language acquisition affects school readiness and reading. Uh, one of the things we've learned about children with reading disorders is that they have trouble with the building blocks of language, the simple sounds that babies are such geniuses at. So we're not just <clears throat> studying it to learn something about, gee, this is great knowledge about how the brain works, but we actually think this knowledge can be put to work. So what have we learned? In studies across the nation and the world's laboratories, we've discovered that early in development, babies can do something that you can't do. Uh, infants are actually citizens of the world. Uh, early in development and up to about six months, babies can hear the distinctions between all the sounds used in all the languages of the world. And that's something you actually can't do. I can't either. Uh, as adult listeners, we're very culture bound. We can hear the distinctions appropriate to our own language. We perceive them, but we can't perceive the distinctions in foreign languages. So something about experience has shaped our perception. It's narrowed it, in a sense. And there will be many analogies to other kinds of learning. But in language, it's generally a narrowing that children start with this universal capacity to distinguish the sounds and then become more like us, very focused on the sounds of a particular language. So the first news then is that babies are this citizen of the world type of perceivers, ready for any language, ready for any culture in which they land. And then the interesting question, the second uh, answer to how they develop is how long does it take before the baby brain starts shaping itself towards a particular language? When do they lose this universal capacity to respond to all languages? And the answer, you might think about it for a moment, what you'd guess about that. Does it take until the child reads? That would be about first or second grade. Does it take when they're talking a lot at the age of four, uh, three perhaps? Or is it something else? And, and the answer is, it's something else, and it's extraordinarily early. What the studies show is between six months of age and 12 months of age, babies change from that citizens of the world approach that they began life with to a more culture-bound style of listening. At six months of age, the babies across all cultures, so the Japanese babies can hear the distinction between R and L just as readily as you and I can. Uh, adults cannot do that in Japan because Japanese doesn't uphold the difference between R and L. They only can distinguish R's from other sounds, but they cannot hear this distinction between R and L. They mix it up in writing, in listening, and in speaking. We do the same with Chinese sounds and many other sounds of all languages. So between six months and 12 months, before first words, babies' brains get tuned to the sounds of your native language. At six months, they can still hear them all. By 12 months, they cannot. And the studies even narrow it down further. It's between eight months and 10 months. Between eight months and 10 months, the baby brain is locking on to the sounds of a particular language. That's amazing. That's amazing. Now, can we keep the baby brain open to the sounds of other languages? And the answer is yes. We've just completed a study in which we brought nine-monthers, nine-month-old babies, into the lab. They came 12 times between nine months and 10 months. And each time, for a half an hour, they'd come in and play on the floor with my Chinese graduate students. I've got five Chinese graduate students who are native speakers of Chinese. English is their second language. 
And they would read books to the kids and play with the toys and squeeze the rattles, but all the while talking Chinese. So from the moment they entered the door till the moment they left, it was only Chinese that they would hear for these 12 sessions. But that's only five hours, right? Five hours of listening. After five hours of listening, by the time they were 10 months, we brought the babies back in the lab again and tested them on the sounds of Chinese. So the typical children at 10 months who are not bathed, who are not listening to Chinese in our little lab test, can no longer hear those distinctions. But the babies who'd been exposed to five hours of Chinese heard the distinctions just as well as the babies in Taiwan who had been listening to, the, to Chinese for 10 months. So again, it's an illustration, a demonstration case of the extent to which the brain is wide open for a certain kind of information at a certain time in development and a natural setting. This wasn't software on the side of the baby's crib. This wasn't audio tapes uh, from the shelves at Toys R Us. This was a real speaker of Mandarin Chinese who sat on the floor with books and objects and played with the children who were wide-eyed at this Chinese speaker with the funny sounds coming out of their mouths. So again, the demonstration is that the kind of learning that babies are doing at this time is automatic. It doesn't take you providing any special reward for the child to do this, uh, you know, reinforcer, so to speak. Learning is in itself reinforcing. They are captivated by language, and their brains are simply mapping it. Now, it isn't just information about second language learning. That, of course, is going to affect how we think about education. I mean, it's a very simple example, but it has a pretty potent message. Uh, when do we teach second languages in America to our kids? <laughs> High school. Um, they're not so enthusiastic about, about French and Spanish in high school. And they're learning it as a very book-oriented phenomenon. You know, they're studying the grammar. They're learning the rules. And it's all very explicit. And they will tell you, if you query them, uh, I know the rules, Mom, my 15-year-old will say. But it's, somehow it doesn't work when I listen to the language. You know, it's, it, there's a disconnect between a cognitive approach to language and the natural way that our brains operate on language early in development. So the nine-month-old babies and up to about six or seven, that learning of language is very, very automatic and very, very natural. Uh, as we get older, uh, that learning is not natural and it isn't very successful. So if you look at uh, studies of, of children all over cultures at the age at which a second language was introduced, between the age of birth and six to eight years, excellent. We're fabulous. Our brains are plastic and we absorb it. From eight to 15, hmm, we're OK, but it's not as good and it's not as natural. After 15, it's, you know, it's not easy. Have you tried lately to learn French or Spanish or any other language? It's difficult. It's difficult. You're going about it in a different way. So the message has a concrete um, bottom line that will aid us in designing educational programs. But there's something even more fundamental that we're discovering about early abilities and their effect on later learning. These studies in, in which we're just looking at infants' abilities to hear very subtle differences between the sounds used in languages. If you measure babies, six months of age, and you chart how well they perform from chance to 100%. And then watch them develop and measure language at 13 months, at 16 months, at 20, at 24 months. We've been in a longitudinal study looking at babies throughout these periods. The kids are now 24 months old. Their six-month-old abilities predict very nicely how well they do in all aspects of language at two years. And we'll continue to follow, the, follow them until they get to school age. Uh, and we think that these early capacities that children exhibit for a particular kind of topic will well predict how, in the absence of any kind of intervention, how well they'll do at that topic, the general language ability in this case, uh, much later. Now, why is that important? That's important because we know that children who have trouble reading for example, uh, have trouble discriminating the differences, the subtle differences between sounds. They also have trouble with letters. But it's a, what we're discovering is that you can take early measures on children and predict later outcomes. 
uh, not to make them better babies, but to intervene at a time when the brain is most plastic with things that might help those who need it, give them a little boost towards the kind of information that they have to come into school with. If they're not ready to learn to read, and that is having all the sound distinctions and the letter recognition and the ability to recognize whole words, by the time they're going into kindergarten, uh, teachers of reading will tell you that a child who can't read at the age of um, eight in third grade is really going to struggle lifelong with that ability. So we're hoping that in a whole range of domains, cognitive tests on memory and learning and perception, uh, emotional social tests that tell us how well this child responds uh, to social cues will allow us to predict um, events far in the future. It might be interesting for you to know that very subtle things can affect, affect language. Here's an example. If you measure uh, visual attention, this is a social signal. If you bring a mother and a child into a room and there's an object on the table and the object is new and the mother casts her gaze towards the object, uh, it's considered a socially uh, adaptive thing, a sophisticated thing to do for the infants to follow their mother's gaze. So if mother looks at the new object on the table and the child follows that gaze to the object on the table, that's a higher level, a more sophisticated social referencing, a social cueing that the baby's picking up. These social abilities also are very strong predictors of language. And you might not predict that the social cues predict language abilities, but perhaps because when we evolved to speak, we evolved to speak because the social demands made it very valuable to communicate with one another. So recognition of the social cues between one another and that predicting language uh, is evidence that there will be subtle relationships uh, among the things, the variables that will turn out to be predictive. So the early learning tests are uh, not only to tell us something about typically developing children and to predict something about their outcomes years later, we're also discovering that these are some of the best tests for children with developmental disabilities. And I'll give you a couple of examples later uh, where some of the um, abilities demonstrated by typically developing kids are very different in children who are diagnosed at two, for example, with autism or autism spectrum disorder. Uh, but I'll tell you about that in a second. So if the brain research is telling us that the baby brain is forging connections at a very rapid rate early in development, and the behavioral studies are telling us that the brain is acquiring information at an astounding rate and doing so automatically. Uh, what does that mean about us? What have we got to do with that? Uh, we're the ones presenting the information to the children, right? We are presenting the sights and the sounds and the objects to the kids. So is there anything we can take away from these examples that tell us what we should be doing? Well, in the area of language, there is a, a pretty concrete example about something that we do quite naturally that affects how the babies learn. Uh, again, if you've been following news magazines and TV programs and newspapers, you know that when we speak to infants and children, we use a tone of voice that's quite atypical. Uh, it's not your job interview voice by any means. <laughs> and the signal when first discovered was called motherese. And then when we learned that fathers did it do too, we started calling it fatherese. And then when it didn't require you to be a parent, you just have to be a person interacting with a, an infant or a child, we started to be politically correct and call it caretaker ease because it's a signal that we all seem to use when we talk to kids. What's it, what does it sound like? Well, in tests in which we bring moms into the laboratory, uh, mothers talk to us and mothers have their children with them and they talk to their children. So let me give you an example. A mother comes in, she sits down, she's talking to me and she said, well, it was awful getting here today. The traffic was bad, and I nearly got a ticket, and, but I'm parked now. It's okay. I'll be fine. And it's the regular pitch that she would normally use, the one I'm using now, 300 hertz, just moving right along. Um, it's not dull, but it's not terribly interesting in terms of the pitch of the voice. And then she turns to her two-mother, and she says, Hello. Can you say hi? Say hi. Hi. I mean, she's hitting the moon with her fundamental frequency. Uh, you can't really do it unless you have a baby in your arms, you know, <laughs> requires a baby. So we have asked lots of questions about this signal. One, uh, 
why do we do it? And two, uh, do babies care? Um, <laughs> We're making fools of ourselves, or at least we think we are, and we want to know whether it makes a difference to them. So first of all, we're not absolutely positive why we do it, um, but we seem to, across all the languages we've studied, some 22 languages, when adults address children, they raise the pitch of their voice by about an octave, they slow down their speech, they make generous and wonderfully beautiful, affectively positive contours in the voice, hello. It's the way we'd all like to be greeted when we come home from work at night, right? Uh, and they speak more clearly. It's a clearer sounding voice. The units in the speech are much better formed, probably because the language is slowed. And when you ask people to listen to the sounds, they are much better at identifying them. We think it's a better signal for the baby brain. So why do we do it? We don't know. But maybe, unconsciously again, when we learned to speak early in ev our evolution, we knew that to get across to our partner, you had to speak clearly. And speaking clearly depends on where you are and who you're talking to. You adjust how you talk all day long. When you talk in front of your undergraduate class, like I do, I speak very clearly and slowly <laughs> to get the points across. When I go home and talk to my family who expects everything that I I'm saying perhaps and maybe not listening, you speak much more quickly and much more, you know, principle of least effort. But when we speak to the children, we speak very carefully. So in tests, we ask, do they care? Uh, we set up a radio station test in the laboratory. Babies sitting in front of an enclosure. Uh, on one side, there's uh, adult voices speaking to other adults in eight second clips. Mothers, mostly, but not the baby's own mother. On the other side, those same mothers but addressing infants in eight second clips. And we give the baby, sit the baby in a little reclining chair and let them choose by little head turns to the right and to the left. And what we see is after about eight trials, the babies will do anything that they have to do to turn on those mothers talking to those babies. They love the signal. And whether it's in Russian or French or Italian, they will choose mothers talking to babies because these universal aspects of the contours are discernible uh, across languages. So do the babies love it? Yes, the babies love it. Do we think it's good for them? Yes, we think it's good for them. Because the clearer speech, it's as though when we speak to children, we clean up our act. We speak more grammatically, simply, about the here and now. It's not baba goo goo baby talk. That's not really how parents talk to their children. They talk more simply, um, and they talk more clearly. And when we do that, we think the brain that is so actively mapping the sounds of language during this period of development is really going to town with these signals. And that that's why their attention is so glued to the human voice and the human face. Uh, you can present babies with many things, but the most fetching signal in the entire world, in the visual world and in the auditory world, is a human face talking. Babies will choose that over anything else you can present to them. So we are playing a role in the brain development. And studies on the brain now in babies, not that we can do these fMRI or PET uh, measurements that you see lighting up the brains in the newspaper articles, but there are many techniques now to study the brain of the baby. We can see uh, development. Uh, we can see the changes in the areas of the brain that are activated. We can see what kinds of signals babies are interested in at particular ages. And the hope there is, of course, that with more studies on this um, science of learning, that we will be able to chart a course that puts information that kids are interested in, in front of them at the time, at the window of opportunity, when they care most about that topic. So language, my bottom line message here is language is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, language is a signal that we can analyze, we can study very readily, and we've learned that babies begin life with very sophisticated capacities and then rapidly uh, through um, brain mechanisms that we have yet to completely understand, uh, map the language that they're hearing. Uh, we believe the same thing is happening in the social emotional domain. Kids start out with sophisticated abilities and then go to town as they are exposed to human beings and how they interact with one another. We know, for example, in the social domain that babies at birth, newborns in the hospital, 
will imitate actions they see an adult person produce. Act, simple actions like opening your mouth or sticking out your tongue. A baby will imitate that as a newborn in the hospital. So there's a connection between humans that's there to begin with. And then, of course, as babies watch people interact, they rapidly acquire information about what's the social game here? How do we interact with one another? So it's not only language, and it's not only social-emotional, but that one uh, for sure, but cognitive abilities too. Learning about objects, what, do we, what is in this world, and how do those things operate? So that by the time you have a one-year-old, you have a baby that's really quite embedded in the culture, in the sounds of the language, in the ways, the social interactions of that particular culture, and in the objects that they manipulate and the value you, they place on them. And this is all done before the baby's first birthday. That ra during this silent period, when the child's not saying anything to you, uh, I've met lots of parents who believe one shouldn't have to talk to a baby because the baby doesn't talk back yet. But the messages here is that the baby brain is like a computer without the printer hooked up. Uh, there's no printing, so you don't see what's going on in there. But the brain is loading its algorithms, really building uh, a neural network that behaves like more, it, it behaves in a more sophisticated way than any computer we can imagine so far. Certainly more than any computer in existence, but even beyond what we can imagine. The brain's trillion nerve cells that the baby was born with and the billions of connections between those nerve cells that are being forged early in development are coding all the information that we're presenting that child. And we need to be aware of that so that we are not expecting that children only know what you see them do. That they know more about language, for example, than you would ever know by just listening for the first word. So uh, in addition to these studies on um, language and social emotional development and cognitive abilities, um, we're interested in the outreach of this information to parents educators and society as a whole. Uh, our academic institutions in the United States are, are forging ahead in the science of learning. The fact that these new brain tools are available makes us more aware than ever that it's a, the brain is a physical entity. I think we've always understood that muscles need exercise, right? You can do this and watch it grow. But I don't think we understood that the brain is, is very similar. It needs exercise to fundamentally wire itself up. And when we start thinking of it as a physical item, then I think it becomes more, we become more aware that you need to feed that. You feed that, the growth of that um, capacity that we have. And so the science of learning is to attempt to understand aspects of development, particularly between zero and five. At the University of Washington, we formed a center for mind, brain, and learning that brings neuroscientists and developmental psychologists and linguists and uh, all kinds of people, computer scientists, because computer scientists are helping us model what the baby's doing, and also companies. We've got a little software company in Seattle whose CEO, Bill Gates, is very, very interested in making computers more sophisticated. And his computers have been working on speech recognition, language recognition for some time, and they've yet to crack the code. Uh, no computer yet has cracked the code that babies at six months seem to be cracking routinely. And so uh, Bill typically says that you know, we're working on it, and we've got our computers to the point where they uh, are interpreting um, recognized speech, the phrase recognized speech, as wreck a nice beach. <laughs> we're getting close. We're not there yet, but we're getting close. So we're hoping that a multidisciplinary center that studies the um, uh, science of learning, when coupled with groups like your own, uh, business leaders, uh, academicians in the school systems, educators, and definitely parents will raise us to a new level in our understanding uh, about children. There's a huge gap between the neuron and the chalkboard. It's not as though today's news will revamp our schools. I think that's naive. On the other hand, there's a level before that at which uh, society's notions about children need to be fundamentally changed. Uh, we need to understand that there is a, a science of learning. We can study how the brain acquires information, 
the new tools and the new science, I think, when coupled with uh, a healthy uh, outreach to parents, educators, and uh, policymakers, uh, can make this a, a better country uh, in which children can learn. I think that in studying children, uh, we have the hope to uh, bring about some changes that will be good for them. I think the other thing to understand is that we were all children once, too. And uh, coming to grips with how we grew up and what we were exposed to, I think will help us not only understand our children, but come to a deeper understanding of ourselves. And there's great value in that, even for adults. Thank you. Thank you so much for that interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering, can you um, describe some specific scenarios and or practices that are exemplary in promoting healthy cognitive or brain development in these critical years? I'm thinking of, of um, daycare providers and daycare and uh, educating our future parents. Good question. Uh, in the arena of language, it's actually quite easy to provide simple things that, that parents and uh, caregivers should do. If you think about children's acquisition of language and all the things that I said, what's the most important thing for the kids? It's to hear language addressed to them. So not only in natural uh, interactions, but, but in reading, and in other things that point them towards the beauty of language and their sense of communication. If you uh, talk to babies in a laboratory setting and watch them closely to see their response, you can see that little 20-week-olds will attempt to imitate what you're doing. You say a simple sound, ah, to a baby over and over again, uh, and bring them in to listen to that sound for a couple of days in a row uh, for just five minutes. Uh, they love the experience, but they will also be shaped by what they heard. And after a while, they will be attempting, you can see it, the looks on their faces, attempting to produce what it is that, that you're producing. And so I think the, uh, for language, it's stimulation. It's to talk to children, to read to children, uh, not necessarily with fancy software or audio tapes, you know, not that kind of, of uh, stimulation, but natural stimulation. Uh, so far in the laboratory, we've discovered that whenever we look hard at how children learn and the optimal settings in which they learn, the more natural they are, the more they're like uh, a real event rather than a, a, a kind of um, faked one, uh, the better children are. So there are two messages there. One is that you don't want to try to accelerate kids. We're not trying to create better babies with this research. What we're discovering is that if you simply allow children to be in settings in which they're really being attended to, so a daycare with uh, eight children to uh, an adult wouldn't be a very good place for a child to be talked to and read to on an individual basis. It doesn't have to be a parent. Any good caretaker who cares about the child can provide this kind of stimulation. Uh, so we're not talking about overstimulating not flash cards with words on them to nine-monthers. That doesn't make sense. But optimal learning seems to take place when children in natural settings are communicating, learning language in a social context with all the cognitive tools there, meaning objects and things in the world that are, that are interesting to talk about. Then children seem to accelerate their language abilities. So I think in, in the language domain, it's quite easy. In other domains, social, emotional, I think it's a little harder for us to specify what's the ideal uh, setting. I can tell you what's not ideal, um, ignoring children, isolating children, being in a, a stressful environment. Uh, again, the brain research says that stress produces biochemicals that do not enhance learning. In fact, just the opposite. So a setting in which children are loved and feel a sense of trust, that should, as best as we can tell now, promotes learning. Uh, are there particular exercises? No, not necessarily. But as I said, babies are naturally drawn to the social setting. They love faces. They love voices. How easy to say that the, the hottest property for a baby is us. You know, We're the stimulation. It doesn't take fancy software. 
doesn't take, you know, uh, special audio tapes and that kind of thing. Not, that's not where learning really transpires. It transpires when people interact in an interesting setting and they're talking about it and it's, uh, it's stimulating. Any others? Uh, my name is Tom Dunn. I'm a City Club member. Uh, thank you very much for your interesting presentation. I, I, I'm sure it will lead to great things. But I do have a little concern, mm -hmm. completely naive, uh, and that is, I, I guess just, I'll use a common terminology, the nerd. Mm. Yes. A, a person with uh, 800 SAT and 450 verbal. And uh, I don't necessarily think that those people have had an unrich upbringing. I, I have some True. reason as a teacher of science to believe mm -hmm. that they haven't. And so I'm a little concerned that you may have in your, your cohorts of babies some people who have some inherent right. lacks and strengths, right. which maybe are not quite touched by the uh, social linguistic program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. When we, stay, when we say we're studying uh, children, we know that in the range of, of children that you're going to study, you've always got two components that are contributing to what that baby, that child, is going to demonstrate on a particular day. One is the inherent capacity they have for that, uh, that domain, for language, for example, or for social, or for cognitive abilities. And the other is what's been brought about by their education or by their environment. And it's only by studying the variation. Look at the variation over children. So when I was talking about these predictive studies, isn't it interesting that at six months, you might be able to predict, uh, just by a simple measurement at six months, how babies' language skills, children's language skills, will look at 24 or 36 months. Now that isn't due, what the measurement at six months isn't, and it's reflective of 36 months, isn't going to reflect the environment. It's going to reflect that inherent capacity of the child for that ability. So what we have in these um, measurements on kids is we think we're tapping some aspect in the early measures of their inherent capacity. And the reason we want to do that early is that you would be able to see children who are not very socially aware, we think. Some of the measures on social interaction might point out children, for example, those who are going to develop uh, autism spectrum disorder. One of the classic symptoms of autism spectrum disorder is a lack of interest in the human face, in looking at the eyes, in social interaction of any kind. A children with autism spectrum disorder would prefer to listen to a mechanical sound as opposed to uh, a human voice sound. But you may also be detecting You could. Absolutely, you could. So I think that until we do a range of studies on a range of skills early, and watch those children develop, we won't know, other than in the domain of language, we do know that this early measure predicts later language, and that that's probably some inherent ability, and yet we think we could um, intervene for the kids who aren't doing it well and boost them a little bit before they get to school. But the full range of what we'll discover is, is not known. In that sense, yes, we're sort of uncovering uh, this capacity to understand children early and make some predictions about how they're going to come out. And uh, that's interesting. I'm Bill Homer, City Club member. Mm -hmm. I once knew a fellow whose parents served in the diplomatic corps. And he was born in Czechoslovakia. And when he was a toddler, he moved to Canada. And he subsequently spend extended periods of time in Greece, Italy, Spain, France, Belgium, and Germany. And the joke was that he spoke seven languages, mm -hmm. none of them well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, right. what does the research show about exposure to multiple languages in terms of your ability to develop linguistically uh, in your mother tongue. Right. It's a very, very interesting question. Uh, we have a grant from the um, Human Frontier Science Program. This is a consortium of the G7 that funds international studies. 
studies that require multidisciplinary and uh, multinational cohorts of scientists. We're now asking that question in Sweden, Finland, uh, Japan, and the United States. We're looking at children who are being raised uh, bilingually or multilingually, as opposed to those being born monolingually, and trying to discern what happens in development. The real question is, is there a limit to the brain's capacity to do these things, to calculate these mathematical, statistical properties on the input? So if they're doing that, and we're convinced babies are doing that when they hear a single language, when they hear two languages, they have to be doing it simultaneously for two. We know that children can acquire two languages quite readily, but we don't know, is there some sacrifice? Is there some uh, cost? Um, is there a cost that's minimized when it, you're exposed at a certain time? It's, it's just an unanswered question, but it's fascinating, deeply fascinating, because it's about, is there no limit on the number of languages that you could learn? That's just an interesting question about the brain. You know, in math or science or any other topic, is there no limit to what we could acquire? Can we be geniuses in a couple of different fields? Again, not to produce that of us, but what's our capacity? And we don't have the answer yet, but we will in about a year. We've just finished the tests on all the seven-monthers in all the countries. And we'll take them up again at 11 months because we've got some exact predictions about what should be happening. If you're trying to map one language and you're listening to an opposite language, one that does everything differently, should that, should that slow you down a little bit? Perhaps. But we'll know. We'll actually know. And I think it's very practical to, to understand the answer to that question and also one that answers a deep theoretical question about brain capacity. What, what can, what are we capable of? So it's, it's a very good question. I'll, I'll tell you in a year. I'm Dr. Jorn Horneman, the Health Issues Committee of City Club. When I learned that throughout one's life one could create new nerve cells mm -hmm. and rewire one's brain in response to new situations. I was filled with hope, which hasn't really materialized. <laughs> <laughs> I'm particularly interested in dyslexia mm -hmm. and attention deficiency disorders. And my question to you is, is there anybody in your field doing work on those conditions, which affect between 4% yes. and 10% of the school population in Oregon. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody doing that work? Uh, we are. We're Some of our colleagues, and we're doing some. Uh, let me give you just some hints about uh, some things we've learned. Um, dyslexia and other reading disorders has a, a part of it that's due to this um, the processing of rapid information, both auditory information and visual information, letters too close together or too close together for children who have reading deficits, and sounds that are so rapidly produced that children with dyslexia cannot discern the differences among them. In standardized tests, uh, children with dyslexia are poor on both of those skills. Now, some treatment measures taken up early enough in life are beginning to demonstrate, but it's not proven, proven sufficiently yet, but it's hopeful that if you take a, a kind of mother -ease approach, slow down the speech, exaggerate the uh, phonetic units, uh, make them louder and clearer, that these kids show gains. They have to listen to it for a long time. There have been some programs developed that alter the speech to make it clearer for children with dyslexia. And if they listen to that over long periods of time, say three months in a summer camp, their improvements are pretty dramatic. And their improvements are not only in reading, but in speaking and in verbal skills in general. So the, we hope that some of these tests that we're <coughs> developing on young children will allow us to diagnose early problems that you might be able to intervene with uh, to help children, and also to take eight, nine, and 10-year-olds and provide them with an assisted a kind of technology that stretches the language in a way that might benefit them. And clinical trials have to be done. You know, it's a long time before you take a treatment and really prove that it's uh, so solidly effective that we'll instill it in all the uh, schools. But I think there's real hope in, in this one, that we may be on to something that capitalizes on what mothers naturally do in stretching sounds that may be of assistance 
to kids who have reading difficulties. And then let me comment just a bit about your, this notion of critical periods and brain cells that, that keep you alive well into your multiple decades. And not that you look a day over 40. Um, <laughs> but there, the new studies do demonstrate that uh, we do generate new nerve cells, though the trillion we're born with is still the most of the, of the brain cells you're ever going to have. However, the connections among them, the connections are very critical. Connections among them are stimulated by intellectual stuff, intellectual thinking, but also by exercise. That rats on treadmills, and this is no joke, rats on treadmills show much better brain connections and much better learning capacities than um, couch potato rats, okay? <laughs> so keep your brain active by thinking and keep your body active, which ap appears to enhance vascular, um, vascular connections, vascular fed connections, so that you keep the brain alive from the standpoint of the physics of it all. So just a, just a little advice. Uh, Ann Kelly Feeney, uh, City Club member. I'm interested in a couple of different topics, particularly uh, if your research is helping you understand what parents should do or in fact uh, what effect they have if they um, put babies in separate rooms and let them cry to kind of train them that to sleep through the night and that kind of thing. And I'm also interested in uh, what babies experience if they're adopted at birth and what mm -hmm. sort of, um, you know, is, is your research in any way giving us insights for mm -hmm. policy right. vis a vis um, social action with children? And is there, I guess my third thought is what do you recommend that we all should invest in to support families and children at the right. very beginning of life? Well, let's see, let's start with the first one. We're not really doing research on the very practical aspects of child rearing, uh, how to, um, how to raise children crying in the night and whether or not you should isolate them or not. Those are important questions, but we're not really doing research on that. We're more focused on the mind and brain. And maybe that will have offshoots to rearing practices of that kind. But we're really interested in, in learning right now. And then the second one was about adoption. Uh, in the domain of language, we see very interesting things when children are adopted a 10-month-old baby coming into the country whose brain is already mapped to their native language will look very strangely at the face and listen to the voice of, of the new uh, English-speaking mom and dad. Uh, the good news is that they seem to start over, or they're quiet for a while, and seem to then begin to coo and babble and uh, produce first words as you would expect them to do. But they, they're actually doing a remapping of the sound structure, we think. So that doesn't say that you have to adopt babies earlier and earlier, but this work would say that you have to give children time if you adopt them at three or six or seven. The language barriers, and, and uh, that just gives you a tip of the iceberg notion of what they're facing culturally and socially. They're remapping the way things are done, linguistically, socially, culturally. We have to give them that, that time to settle into this new environment if they're coming from another country. Uh, I also think that uh, you should be aware that if babies are um, adopted from orphanages in which they've been isolated, we're now seeing the impact on the children who have uh, come from orphanages in which there's very little human attention, very few toys, um, and very little language uh, directed towards them, that they're really behind. And the catching up process is very, very slow. And it's not absolutely sure that, that the entire uh, range can be caught up. So those uh, studies are ongoing with uh, children and uh, as adoptees and are very important to us, very important to the children. Did you have a third? Have I forgotten? Social policy, social policy I, you know, it's, again, it's hard to prescribe social policy. I'm not a policy maker. Uh, I'm a researcher. I think what's important is that we need groups of people working together. Uh, I'm not an educator of, of children. Uh, it's, I think the best that can happen is that the scientists do the research and we talk a great deal to parents, to educators, and to policy makers. Policy makers will have to translate this into policy. Exactly what the right thing to do, I don't know. 
Countries do it differently. Uh, Sweden has a 15-month leave policy for either mother or father or a combination of them. Of course, their taxes are a lot higher, too. Uh, we have to learn in this country what the impact is on kids of the way they're reared, uh, the amount of attention that they get, and then translate that to a policy we can all live with because it affects taxes, it affects the whole gamut from left to right. So it has to be looked at very, very, very deeply. So we have yeah. time for one more question. Oh, How appropriate that the last one. Yeah, that's right. What does the little tyke have to say? She's been sleeping. Ah. I'm sure she has been listening, though. <laughs> my name is Gisela Wendling, and uh -huh. this is Hannah, and we are not City Club members at this point. Mm -hmm. And um, my husband and I are currently going through the decision-making process as to whether or not to raise her bilingually. Mm -hmm. I'm German, he's American, mm -hmm. he doesn't speak German. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've been talking to her in German at times. I've been singing German songs to her. I've been remembering children's song that I'd long forgotten. And um, so I'm wondering what does it really entail? What kind of effort do I need to make in order to raise her bilingually, right. given the fact that I'm the only one who speaks German in the household? Right. And then in addition, uh, what we are both concerned about is by my husband not speaking German, he would be excluded from the relationship I have with her if I have to speak to her German all the time. Well, <laughs> so what advice do you what have? What advice? What advice? <laughs> well, um, there are many ways to to um, address this issue, but I can tell you one thing that that might help, and that is of the bilingual kids that we have studied. The, the children who seem to learn both languages best are ones in which one member of the family speaks predominantly one language and the other member of the family speaks predominantly the other language. And so when you talk as a threesome, you'll have to adopt one of the two languages. But there's a lot of time in which dad's talking to baby and mom's talking to baby. And it appears as though it helps the kids keep them separate, keep the two languages separate by having, not the parents, the, the languages, by associating that language with a particular person. So if German, it's as though you've got a grandmother who speaks you know, Russian, and when grandma comes, you speak Russian. And it, it helps children, perhaps, make the switch in attention required to go from one language to another. It's like grandma's language. So if your child thinks of you as speaking in one way and your husband is speaking in another, it may, in this early period, help them form two separate maps, which is what we think they're doing in the brain, an area that's devoted to English and an area that's devoted to German. So that's a, a practical recommendation based on what we've learned by talking and studying bilingual children. What we don't know is when's the perfect time to introduce that second. We don't know when it's perfect. Early is better than late. And for how long? I, well, I think language is a, a living thing. I think it's a lifelong thing. If you really want your child to speak German, I think you have to keep that language alive. Early exposure would make it a lot, even if you stopped after a couple of years, would make it a lot easier to learn it again as a 20-year-old just being exposed early in development. We do know that. But if you want to keep it alive and really create a German-English speaking child, then you need to keep the language alive. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you very much, Patricia. And we are looking forward. <laughs> we are looking forward to your visit next year to give us the results of all this exciting study. City Club is adjourned. <laughs>